Picture yourself there, 2,000 years ago, on a hill called Golgotha. Rushed through a farce of a trial, condemned by false accusations, Jesus was brutally scourged and nailed to a Roman cross. The greatest crime that those hands ever committed was healing the crippled and opening the eyes of the blind. Yet here he was, spiked to the instrument of torture, the sign, Jesus, King of the Jews, above his head for all to read. Jesus came to this earth and he gave his life. The Bible says he died, he rested in the tomb, and three days later, Jesus came back to life again. Proving the resurrection didn't happen would not just be devastating, it would be downright catastrophic. And it was on the reality of this event taking place that Jesus staked his entire claim to divinity. The world hasn't seen the last of Jesus Christ. He's coming back and we're going to see him. To every believer, this is wonderful news because his death is a substitute for my death. His resurrection is assurance of my own should I die. And his ascension is a guarantee of ours with him when he comes. His resurrection isn't a theological idea. It's a fact through which God personally promises to us that the deepest, darkest sadness we feel because of sin and death, it will be healed when Jesus comes because he's able to raise us from the dead if we die. He has conquered death. Jesus Christ is alive. Early on that Sunday morning, on the first day of the week, the women went to anoint Jesus' body. And when they arrived at his tomb, they were met by an angel who told them the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He is risen. This news first excitedly whispered in the streets of Jerusalem. It came like an electric shock to the world. It shook the Roman Empire that Jesus had risen from the dead. He is not here. He has conquered the grave. He's alive. This news alone, it sets Christianity apart from dead superstitions and archaic religions, and it brings it into a category all of its own. With this very news ringing in their hearts, Christ's disciples, they turned the world upside down, preaching everywhere He is risen. You may have heard of the rock opera, the 1970s rock opera, Jesus Christ Superstar. It actually finishes with Jesus's death and it leaves him in the tomb. But Jesus didn't stay in the tomb. Death couldn't hold him. And let's be totally honest. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, Christianity would be pointless. It would just be another world religion. And the apostle Paul knew that. That's why he said in 2 Corinthians 15, verse 14, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. His death alone was not enough to secure our salvation. But praise God, the Bible tells us that Jesus is alive. And guess what? He is living for you. The empty tomb declares that Jesus was the Messiah. He is God. For 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to many different people. In fact, the Bible even tells us on one occasion, he appeared to a group of 500 people. That's in 1 Corinthians 15. He continued to teach his followers about the kingdom of God. 40 days after his resurrection, the 40th day was very different. Just over a month had passed since the crucifixion and Jesus led his followers to the same place they had been over a month before, the Mount of Olives. Many memories were connected with this place. And the Bible records a remarkable plot twist happens here. Jesus defied gravity and ascended up off the earth and up into heaven. His mission on earth, a completed success, he left. We read about this in Luke chapter 24, verses 49 to 52. Behold, 
and this is Jesus speaking, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven and they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Now, I think most of us have a hard time saying goodbye to someone that we love. Thanks to the long distance relationship that I had with my husband before we got married, he and I became goodbye airport experts because we were always saying goodbye in the airport. Praise God, we decided to say goodbye to those goodbyes. But one thing I know is that what we read here in the book of Luke, this is not how you do a good goodbye because Jesus unconventionally leaves and the Bible says that his disciples have great joy. Now you would think after the trial and the crucifixion, the terrible events of those things, that Jesus' followers would be depressed and defeated and even seeing him leave them, that they would be sad. But the Bible says their faces beamed with joy and triumph. His disciples went back to Jerusalem just like Jesus told them to. And there they prayed and waited to receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. No one was arguing over who was the greatest now. It was Jesus. After 10 days of praying together, an extraordinary event takes place. We read about it in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Wow. Imagine it, the sound of a roaring wind, fiery flames that looked like tongues hovered above their heads and 120 followers of Jesus who were present boldly began proclaiming God's marvelous works in languages they had never learned before. And people from all over town, they gathered together as they heard the disciples speaking in their own languages and they were amazed. But of course, some people mocked and said, ah, these guys are just drunk. That's why this is all taking place. But notice what it says in verse 14 of the same chapter. But Peter, standing up with the 11, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk. Verse 15, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. They weren't drunk. He makes sure they know it. It's nine o'clock in the morning when this is taking place. And then to answer their questions, the disciple who had so recently denied knowing Jesus, now completely changed, baptized with the Holy Spirit, he speaks up and he invites the listeners to turn their attention to the writings of Bible prophets. And the two that he draws from here are the prophets Joel and David. And by the way, if you are ever wondering what is going on in the world, the answer is found in Bible prophecy. Peter powerfully points out that the resurrection and ascension of Jesus was not a surprise. These had been predicted in prophecy. And then he adds this. You've got to see this. Verse 33. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Peter said that what was happening that day indicated that Jesus had been enthroned at the right hand of God. This is an incredible thought. Think about it with me for just a moment. The same Jesus who restored the sight of the blind, who walked the dusty streets of Jerusalem, who healed the sick, who had even been crucified, he is risen and alive and seated at the right hand of God. 
And this same theme, the same message we find communicated in other places in Scripture too. In Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Now, if you've never heard of a high priest before, let's remind ourselves what this is in the Bible. A high priest is someone who stands before God in his temple, who is appointed by God to represent his people before him, is selected from God's people to act for or in their behalf. And of course, since Jesus had come down to this earth, lived among us, died for us, he was able to represent us as our high priest in heaven. And fourthly, a high priest is someone who is anointed with oil into his office. I'm thinking of Psalm 133 verses one and two. Listen to this. Here the psalmist writes, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, who was anointed as a high priest in Israelite history, running down on the edge of his garments. Pentecost was an earthly event confirming an incredible heavenly reality that Jesus had been inaugurated as our high priest and king. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit was simply signaling his enthronement that this is a wonderful event. All authority in heaven and on earth belongs to him. As our high priest, Jesus gives us access to a glorious temple in heaven. You see, the earthly sanctuary was really just a miniature of the heavenly one. It was a miniature copy of the heavenly one. And when you understand what it means to have Jesus as our high priest. When you understand the benefits of Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, guess what? It will make a world of difference to all who believe in him because it can mean the difference between being consumed with guilt or triumphing in grace. Being the difference between being frustrated with defeat in your life or rejoicing in victory that comes from God. After World War I, when many French soldiers were returning from fighting the Germans in trenches, they would approach the city of Paris and there on the Arc de Triomphe, I probably said that with a bad French accent, I'm sorry, but this Arc was built by Napoleon. Up, Up on the top of the Arc was a robed choir. And as the dirty, bloody soldiers approached this Arc, some helping their crippled and blind comrades, others still covered with the blood spattered on them from fallen friends, the choir on the top would sing out, what right have you to enter the Arc of Triumph? And of course, that was an English transliteration. And the soldiers would stop before that choir. They would lift up their voices and they would cry, we have been to Verdun, we have been to Verdun. Then the soldiers would be given a hero's welcome in all heaven. If you can just transport your minds from that scene and think about the heavenly one, all heaven must have waited for Jesus' ascension to his father. Countless angels came to escort him triumphantly to the holy city. You can imagine the scene in heaven when Jesus made his way to the gates of the holy city and the waiting angels cried out as one, who is this king of glory? And accompanying angels with Jesus sang out a reply, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Friends, Jesus could say, I have been to Calvary. And because Jesus went to the cross, because he rose from the dead and because he ascended to heaven, because he is enthroned for us, it means four amazing things. This is why the disciples were excited on the day of Pentecost. Point number one, because Jesus is enthroned, we have access to God's eternal power. If someone is on the right hand of someone, they have authority. Peter and the followers of Jesus were excited because they had a friend in heaven who loved them and had all power and all authority. In fact, Peter wrote about this in 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22. It says, Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. 
just the other day, I'm a little bit ashamed to say I was bragging about uh, the fact that a distant relative of mine owns the local cafe where some colleagues of mine were having a morning breakfast together. But friends, when you know Jesus, you know more than a cafe owner. You know the one who is seated on the right hand of the throne of God. And he is so powerful that listen to this. Hebrews 7, 25 says, therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. You know, we've all had bad experiences with helplines. They're great in theory, but a nightmare in practice. You dial the number. You wait, the music plays, finally an operator picks up. And when you get through spelling your name and you tell them your problem, the reason why you've called them, the person on the other end of the line often will say, I'm sorry, but you've called the wrong department. Let me transfer you. And the process goes on and on. Imagine being able to ring the company and on the other end of the phone, the person who picked up was your friend. Friends, Jesus is more than a helpline. He is God and he is seated at the right hand of God. He has power. And this is a great comfort. I mean, it will bring you comfort in your good days and in your bad days. When a man named Stephen was told, well, he told rather the Jewish Sanhedrin, that is like the Supreme Court of Israel, that in crucifying Christ, they had murdered God's righteous son. The Sanhedrin were mad. But just before his stoning, Stephen said he looked up and in vision he could see this in Acts chapter 7. He said, I see heaven open, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen stood condemned before a corrupt human court on earth, but another greater judge was standing for him in heaven, standing also as his defense lawyer. And it was as if Jesus was saying, no matter what happens to you, I have defended you and you, I declare not guilty. That's good news. God is that powerful. Jesus is intercession in heaven. In, in the heavenly sanctuary, it has the power to save to the uttermost all who open their hearts to him. And he is able to offer to all an eternity with him if they will accept him. His mercy, his grace, his power, his love, all of this we have and all that we need in Christ. Because of Jesus, we have a direct line to God through prayer. We've got a friend in the highest place in the universe. And whenever you're in trouble and you need a friend in high places, what you need, you have in heaven. He is risen for you. Maybe you're battling cancer. Maybe you're battling some illness, bitterness, betrayal, pride or discouragement. You can pray to God with confidence because you have a powerful friend in heaven who is interceding for you. We just read in Hebrews, he's interceding for you at the right hand of the throne of God. When I'm down, Jesus is interceding for me. When I feel like my faith is going to give way, Jesus is interceding for me. What we feel has nothing to do with it. Who Jesus is, is everything. Do you believe in Jesus? In Romans 8 verse 34, the Bible says it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God and also makes intercession for us. I love this story and I have to share it of a lady who approached her pastor and she said, I really want to give my life to Jesus, but I am struggling to quit smoking. Can you help me? So the pastor, he shared some tips about how she could drink more water and detox and some other strategies. And then he shared with her from the Bible how she could surrender those cigarettes to God to be free and to let that bondage be gone. And he read to her this verse. It's from Philippians 4, verse 13. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because he is powerful, remember? And so she said, well, I don't think I can do it. The pastor said, well, what does the Bible say? She said, pastor, I'm too weak. The pastor said, get a pen. And I want you to write next to that verse. I can do all things except quit smoking. Write it next to it. If you believe it, you better correct your Bible. And she said, oh, I'm not writing that in my Bible. But she got the point. Friends, don't look at your weakness. Look to Jesus in his strength. They prayed that woman was able to gain the victory over cigarettes because God gave her the victory. It was his power that broke her free. No life is beyond the help of God. And this brings me to my next point. 
because Jesus is enthroned. Not only do we have access to God's power, but we also have access to his pardon. Acts chapter 5, verse 31 says, Him God has exalted to the right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. When Jesus was crucified, he prayed one of the most beautiful prayers, one of the most remarkable prayers I've ever heard. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then he went to heaven to personally guarantee that forgiveness. Today, Jesus is in heaven's sanctuary, blotting out the sins of all who ask him for forgiveness, applying the merits of his blood and the power of his sacrifice to give them victory and cleansing. As our high priest, he applies the, the salvation that his blood has won for us. And so whatever your sins might be right now, there is a need for grace and mercy. Come to Jesus because he has both. In fact, notice this in Hebrews 4, 14 and 15, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. That's powerful. In fact, the whole theme of the book of Hebrews is that Jesus is better. His high priestly ministry is better than that of any earthly priest. His sacrifice is better than that of any earthly sacrifice. Why? Because he was sinless. And you say, Sharissa, how could Jesus understand what it's like to have a, to have a, a husband leave you and cry yourself to sleep every night? Or, or how would he understand what it's like to be a drug addict and need another fix of drugs or for a woman who's being experiencing the pain of divorce, the trauma of divorce is rejection. Friends, Jesus experienced rejection from those closest to him too. Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. These things broke him. And the greater your ability to love, the greater your ability to hurt. Remember when Christ fasted in the wilderness for 40 days, you can guarantee his body was crying out with urges far greater than any drug addict. He endured physical, mental, emotional, spiritual agony on the cross. On the cross of Calvary, all the powers of darkness convened to inflict the greatest trauma that they could on Christ. There is no type of trauma that you can go through that Jesus hasn't already experienced to the max. And since the son of God became the son of man, he understands your trial. He understands your struggle with sin. He understands your weakness and he can be a sympathetic high priest for you. Hebrews 4, 16 says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God's grace is not just pardon. It's also power to help us live for Jesus. All we have to do is come to him as we are and he changes us. We make the choice. He makes the change. Point number three, we gain access through the ascended Christ to God's power, God's pardon, and also God's presence. You think about it, in his human flesh, Jesus was limited by time and space. He couldn't be with each one of his followers all at once, but the Holy Spirit can. Christ's enthronement meant the comforter, the Holy Spirit could come. And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit his very presence was proof that Jesus had been enthroned in heaven and given authority that very day. The night before the cross, Jesus had told his disciples these things in John 14, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth. Today, the Holy Spirit makes real to us the presence of Jesus. Jesus had to go away so that the Holy Spirit could come and stay. He gives us the spoils of Christ's victory, that is spiritual gifts. And I need to say this because in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, the Bible says this, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. A mediator is a go-between. There is no pope or bishop or saint or human being that can stand between you and God. Omniscience, omnipotence and omnipresence, they belong to him alone. So friend, go straight and direct to Jesus as your mediator, as your great high priest. Jesus is living for you today. Point number four. Finally, because Jesus ascended, we not only have access to God's power, God's 
pardon, God's presence, but also his everlasting promises. Jesus promised that he would personally, physically, gloriously return. In Acts 1, it says, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, also who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Friends, the world hasn't seen the last of Jesus Christ. He's coming back and we're going to see him. To every believer, this is wonderful news because his death is a substitute for my death. His resurrection is, a, is an assurance of my own should I die. And his ascension is a guarantee of ours with him when he comes. In a sense, my husband pointed this out to me, the three parts of salvation are pictured in Christ's amazing love act justification, sanctification, and glorification, because we are justified through his blood on the cross that was shed for us. We are sanctified through the power of his resurrection. And guess what? We are guaranteed to be glorified because of Jesus and because of his ascension when Jesus comes. When Neil Armstrong landed on the moon for the first time, he famously said something like, one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. He was speaking as though he was a representative for all of us. And people certainly felt that way. And they were saying things like, we've landed on the moon. Humanity had reached new territory. And it's mind boggling because when you and I look up at the sky and we see the moon, we can think that there are actually human footprints on the moon. A giant leap for humankind, but an infinitely more wonderful and important one happened in the ascension of Jesus. His presence is in heaven is a guarantee of ours there by God's grace one day. Because he physically ascended, one day we too will physically ascend and join him there. His resurrection isn't a theological idea. It's a fact through which God personally promises to us that the deepest, darkest sadness we feel because of sin and death, it will be healed when Jesus comes because he is able to raise us from the dead if we die. He has conquered death. Jesus ascended to prepare a place for us and to prepare us for that place. Thanks to Jesus, heavens open to all who will put their faith in him. And listen, by faith, you, I'm sitting on this chair right now. <laughs> by faith, you sit on a train and expect it to stop where you want it to go. If you take faith and put faith in Jesus and accept him as your Lord and Savior and invite him to come into your heart, you will know that he is who he claims to be. Because he has risen and ascended, we have access to God's amazing pardon, power, presence, and promises. Even though the disciples of Jesus must have only dimly understood the blessings that they were receiving through the ascended Christ, they had great joy. And Luke's gospel begins with the angels telling the shepherds at his birth that they had news which would bring great joy to all people. And it ends with the disciples having found that joy. Today, right now, if you will put your faith in Jesus, if you will believe in him, you too can experience great joy. You see, the cross of Christ reveals God's love at its best and man's sin at its worst. It shows us the price of sin and how utterly lost we are without Jesus, but also how greatly loved we are. Friends, Jesus loved you enough to stay on the cross. He loved you when you didn't love or want him. In the words of Spurgeon, if you reject him, he answers you with tears. If you wound him, he bleeds out cleansing. If you kill him, he dies to redeem. If you bury him, he rises again to bring resurrection. Jesus died for you and now he lives for you. On the day of Pentecost, as Peter's audience realized what had happened, that Christ that had been crucified was now enthroned in heaven, they were deeply convicted. Their sins had enabled the greatest crime ever committed, deicide. Their sins had necessitated the death of the Son of God. And so Peter calls them to turn away from sin and to turn to the risen Savior ascended for them. 
and he invited them to be baptized. Why? Romans 6 verses 3 and 4 says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. But just as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should walk in newness of life. Baptism is how we personally accept and publicly commit our lives to Jesus, who so completely committed himself to saving us. You have a friend in heaven who bears in his body the scars of the great price he paid for your salvation. And do you know that throughout all eternity, the only man-made things in heaven will be Jesus' scars from the cross? Zechariah 13 verse 6 says, One will say to him, What are these wounds between your arms? Then he will answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. He was wounded so that we could be healed. And he has risen. He has risen for you. Will you give your life to Him? We live in difficult times. Many are worried and distressed. Right now, I want to encourage you and to invite you to put your trust in the only one who can save you. Today, right now, you have the privilege of knowing the one who is seated at the right hand of the majesty of heaven. Do you have problems? Are you facing something that is beyond you? Something you can't handle? Come to Jesus. He's enthroned for you. If you've never been baptized, never given your life to Him, text or call the number on your screen and say, just simply text us and say, I want to give my life to Jesus and we'll connect with you. And we want to pray with you. Why wait to give your life to the one who carried a cross for you? Jesus is risen for you. And I appeal to you right now to live for Him. Hi there, I'm so glad that you could join us for the He Is Risen series. This is just the very surface of what there is to learn about Jesus and especially the closing scenes of his life. It's a powerful study. And if you'd like to know more about this amazing subject, I'd like to uh, just bring two free offers to your attention. The first one is this book here called The Desire of Ages. It's a beautiful book, a commentary really on the life of Jesus. If you haven't got a copy, please text us or call us and let us know that you would like this. And otherwise, there is this one. It's a smaller book. It's called The Passion of Love. He did it for you. This is also a beautiful book. And it is actually just a shortened version of the end part of this book. But it would make a wonderful book for you to read and even share with a friend. So text us or call us. We look forward to hearing from you. May God bless you as you continue to learn more about Jesus.